And hello, everyone, and welcome to the Copyright 2.0 Show. My name is Jonathan Bailey. I am from the site Plagiarism Today, which can be found at plagiarismtoday.com. And joining me, as usual, is the man behind the wonderful iFroggy Network, a wonderful grouping of sites you can find at iFroggy.com, Patrick O'Keefe. How are you doing? I'm doing good. How are you? First regular show back from the holidays. I'm doing pretty good. I can't complain. It's uh, been a crazy week getting back from Thanksgiving and some time away. It's always tough, always tough, but trying my best and the struggle through it. So, <laughs> you caught up yet? Uh, I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm caught up. I, um, I'm caught up in as much as uh, I was a couple days ago. Was pretty much on top of everything until I turned the calendar and realized that I have a, I had a speaking engagement on Sunday and I wasn't really confirmed. And then I was like, huh, that's right. I haven't heard from them in a month and a half. So uh, checked in and yeah, still being expected to do it. Should be fun. Um, but now I'm kind of preparing for that, putting some things together on top of a few other things that have popped up all of a sudden. Um, so yeah, but I'll be I'll be fun and yeah, had a uh, sorry. Go ahead. Was that the engagement you were uh, speaking about on Facebook? The uh, the one about the worst things that you've heard been. Yeah, yeah, kind of. It's about it's kind of a, f a fun talk about just the, the worst, uh, some of the some of the worst things. I mean, nasty things that people say to moderators, and they've said to me managing online communities over the years. I wish I had kept better track of all of it because while it's all documented, at least on the communities I still run now, it's it's all documented. I can go back and look at it because we keep great documentation, but. Just picking out and remembering, like, who said that or what was that? Because you forget about those conversations. Oh, yeah. for, unless they're sure. really bad. Like, someone called me a dirty Irish F-bag. I remember that. You know, because <laughs> that, was, that was kind of a memorable takedown. But, you know, and, but, I mean, how many times do people call you Hitler? In fact, that's mm -hmm. right. I should do a search for Hitler on the CardiForms.com documentation. I need to make a note to do that, actually. Um, yeah, I'm going to write my calendar, Search Hitler. So I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna do that later tonight. I'm gonna go on accreditforms.com and remember documentation and search for the word Hitler to get a count of how many times people have called me Hitler over the years on that community. Um, so that's good. That's a good idea. This can see that came out of just bouncing the ideas off you there. So that's why it's good to just talk with people. But 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 yeah. So I'm pulling up all these things people say. Um, it's gonna be fun. I'm gonna talk about you know. Basically, they want to know that they're not alone. Right? It's, I'm doing a talk for Australian National University, one of the top 100 universities in the world, and they have a really substantial mental health department. And part of what that mental health department does is run an online community for people with mental health issues. So as you can imagine, they have some unique yeah. challenges that they face. And uh, on top of that, though, they they have moderators and they call all sorts of names. And basically, they want to know that if that's normal <laughs> and, and, and how I look at it, how I deal with it myself. So I'm gonna I'm gonna share a lot of little stories and quotes that real quotes from actual members over the years that I've banned or maybe that I still have in some cases. Uh, things people have said to me, of course anonymized, not attributed to them, but um, you know <laughs> quotes, and then talk about kind of the general philosophy behind it, how I handle it, how I try to keep the heat off of my staff. Um, it should be a fun, uh, interesting talk. <laughs> you know, if you want to have a drinking game with this talk, I do a shot every time Patrick mentions Hitler. You will probably yeah. be dead. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm going to share my uh, Hitler's... Uh, no, you know what? I, I don't know if you saw this post I did a while back, but it was this Facebook profile of a community manager as viewed by a band member. And yeah, I did they, see that. Yeah, so I'm going to try to use that in there. And, you know, it, for those who don't know, it's got, the, the, it was basically a Facebook profile with a lot of jokes about being Hitler, a Nazi, um, also uh, about being involved with the Illuminati. <laughs> so so there, there was a lot of different jokes in there. But it's all good fun. Yeah, it is. I mean, so, yeah, it sounds like an interesting talk, and as I, I'm already laughing from the few things you've said. I yeah. just I find it amusing that you now have the words search Hitler in your calendar. That has me very yeah, nervous. It's, hey, it's, it's, it's written in chicken scratch, but I'll hold it up to the camera here. You know what? I'll improve that a little bit before I hold it up. It's a little, it's a little messed up. Let me write that clearer. Search... Hitler. Usually, only I read this, so I don't need it. Let me see. Let me get that up there. Oh shoot! You know, with Google Plus, let me let me hey, maximize myself. There we go. I can see what. There it is at 12:30. He's the search Hitler. <laughs> yeah, the time frame isn't so much. Well, I pay attention to that. I don't pay attention to that, but just the list of things on this day. Uh, and near the top is C25, which is my shorthand for Copyright 2.0 Show at five. No, oh, there you go. But yeah, if if ever you get 
caught under suspicion or like a no-fly list or something, I'm sure the fact you would search Hitler in your calendar would be stated as a reason. <sighs> yeah. Oh, yeah. no. Man, but seriously, it sounds like an awesome talk. I, mean, I, I, I hope that there's some way I'm able to see at least part of it. Now, there, it sounds like it's going to be a lot of fun, but... You know, and that's, I agree, though. It's very cathartic because, I mean, it, having, I, I did community administration for a while. It's a very lonely job, you know. It feels like it's you and against we, the world sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, that's the great thing about um, uh, having moderators and a really strong team of people because yeah. at least at that level you have someone to, um, you know, I guess commiserate with in a way. So, you know, you can share those things. And I, I mean, with my staff members, I'm pretty much an open book. I, every time that I have a conversation with a member that it goes beyond just normal kind of stuff and, and pleasantries and a positive conversation, I always share that entire conversation with my staff members, the private message that I receive. So they can see what I receive, what I said, how I handle situations. And so if anything comes with that member, they can always be like, well, uh, there you go. I, we know why Patrick did this because we know what happened the whole time. We can follow the whole string of conversation. So it really builds a really strong, tight unit. And um, that's where you get a lot of support from. So, uh, you know, I'm going to, I guess I should talk about that with them as well. Yeah, you that, put that on your calendar too. Don't yeah. <laughs> uh, where I share all conversations. Done. So did you have a productive Black Friday, Cyber Monday? Uh, yeah, we, uh, we, we bought some stuff for us. And yep. I bought a new suit, actually. Um, okay, awesome. I realized after attending a funeral recently and uh, a <laughs> speaking engagement in, um, in Columbus right. that I needed a new suit. I mean, long story short, it was time. And yeah. so JCPenney had a really, really nice three-piece suit on sale for $160, pants and um, shirt. I had the vests. Cool. Um, so I got that, and uh, we picked up some shelving units for the Now, garage. the suit isn't, it's in, it's not in black, right? It's uh, black with gray stripes. Okay. Gray I was gray. joking. I expected it to be black. Um, a black suit. No, I'm sure you wear other colors. It's just that, you know, when you, you know, you have a preference, I guess. Yeah, I do have an extreme preference. Yeah. It's fair to say. But, yeah, so that's going to be nice. i um, looking forward to that. I'm going to take some photo, new photos in it with, uh, for the site. Um, and hopefully that will be uh, up soon. That will be, that'll be fun. But uh, yeah, so that was the the big thing for me personally was getting that. Um, I've, I've been putting it off because it was really weird. I mean, I don't know if many people know me this well, but way back when I was in like college and so forth, I was really really thin. But mm -hmm. I had some stuff in like 2005, 2006, and I put on a lot of weight. Yeah. And so the suit I had wouldn't fit me. But then I got healthy and I lost the weight, lost every pound of it pretty much. And so then I had to go back to wearing my old suit. <laughs> and it's just, you still had it, I guess. Yeah, I still had it. It was in the closet. It was well protected and maintained and cared for. But I was like, you know, so I just realized how ridiculously old it was and worn. And it's like, yeah, it's time to get a new one. And this one's nice. I like it. So it's going to be good. Um, like I said, that and some shelving units for the garage were our only purchases, really. You? Uh, you know, I found a ton of good deals. I bought, I got stuff I can't talk about, gifts for people. Um, right. Fair, fair, fair. So I picked up a lot of cool things for my family, for Sean and Trent especially. And oh, that one watches. Um, you can say what gifts you got for. Yeah, that, that, you know what? They don't. But it's like I don't want to piss in case. Like they're right. Trent would never watch this. Sean, no, doesn't watch this at all unless I tell him, "Hey, watch this. You should do this. We're gonna do something funny." But <laughs> no, they're, they're not gonna. <laughs> I mean, because he's not gonna tune in to learn about comedy, right? I mean, uh, fair enough. Fair enough. You know, just to, just to be honest. Um, you know, maybe if we have a really good film thing, I can say, hey, we're going to talk about this film thing, which we always talk about film, but it's always like the MPA sue somebody or something along those yeah, lines. Yeah, we're doing so, that this week, but yeah, good. Every, and every week. But uh, I picked up a lot of good things, but then I, I there was just random deals. Um, I placed a really good order with Perry Ellis, which is a clothing line I like a lot. They had a really great, really great Black Friday sale where I just got tons of great things, sneakers, dress shoes, dress pants, uh, a new wallet, two watches, sunglasses. Dying. Just belts, all all different stuff that I'll need. I use primarily when I speak. A lot of that to dress pants and stuff when I go yeah. to conferences and things. But just a great like buying pants for ten dollars <coughs> at a regular eighty dollars. You know, getting watches for like twenty dollars are usually eighty dollars. Those sorts of things. It was just a great deal. So I got all that. Um, got some T-shirts. I including this one right now. I'm wearing. I don't know. You know, if you can read that. It says Biggie, Biggie, Biggie. Biggie, Biggie yeah. It's an allusion to the song by the Notorious B.I.G. Hypnotize. Yeah, hypnotizing. Yeah, you know, yeah. like hypnotizing. I actually know that song. Yes. Yeah. 
So it's like a hypnotizing thing with the black and white. So I, I like this shirt. I got it for like seven dollars. Yeah. yeah. Um, Every time I think of that song, I think of the music video where he's driving in reverse, running from the cops on the bridge. Yeah, that's right. Diddy, Diddy's driving him backwards, and yeah, that's a that's an iconic uh, video. But let's see, what else did I get? I bought a pay. I got a PayPal here reader for your phone. You know, they can scan credit cards mm -hmm. with PayPal. I got that because I got it for a profit of 301, so I actually will make 301. But I actually might want it because I feel for like business stuff, I might actually use it. Um, you can get it for free if you want. They have a rebate when you activate it. So you just get $15 in your PayPal account, and it costs $15. Let's see. What else did I buy? Um, I got some new pillows for my bed. Uh, there was a deal, some Calvin Klein pillows that were $7 each. So that was a great deal. <laughs> I picked up that. Uh, gosh, what else? What else? Um... Hold on one second, and I'll have you. Know, I'll have a little more information. I have my. I, I actually, by some chance, I actually made a list of things that I bought. Um, yeah, I bought. Like I said, some T-shirts. I bought. Um, uh, I bought a uh, game recorder. Uh, gosh, what's it called? The. Um, oh man, like we. I had the HTPBR from Hot Pog, You know that. But then I bought a, a new one that is looks a lot easier and is going to be a lot more seamless to use and is much smaller so it's more portable. Mm -hmm. I also bought a, uh, a new PlayStation 3 because mine broke and when I priced it out with the deal that was in place, I'm, I'm pretty much just going to sell my old one with a new hard drive in it. And, you know, whatever. Some other things too. Different things I can't even remember right now. But all in all, it was a productive Black Friday, Cyber Monday. Sounds good. <clears throat> Excuse me. But yeah, it sounds like you had a good time of it. Yeah. And most yeah. of that you did online, I'm assuming, right? Oh, all of it. Yeah, all of it. Yeah, all of it. All of it online. Yeah, we actually went to the stores for some of it. We, That's cool. But we actually did the thing where it's like we show up at like 4 p.m. and it's like nobody's there. Yeah. But the deals are still going on. And because we knew the stuff that we wanted wasn't going to be like the stuff everyone was running for right at, when they opened. Right. So it was like, well, I'll just show up whenever we, uh, you know, feel right. like it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's funny to me. People complain about Black Friday, but I was thinking about it, and I had a thought. I was going to save it for a blog post, but I'll share it here. Okay, go ahead. Um, you know, just the thought that, really, Black Friday on some level is, yes, people are getting deals and saving money, which they always want to do, but it's also kind of a form of entertainment for a lot of people. Uh, it's something to do, to go. Like, my mom went last year to Black, Black Friday in the morning with a, a couple friends of hers, and it's not that she had to go because she really didn't buy much, but she just had a good time going. Um, and, and spending time and, you know, looking at the deals. And so to me, though, with the, the danger of Black Friday, right, the stampedes, the whatever, the danger that occurs, I was thinking about it, and really, on the whole, Black Friday can't be any more dangerous than going to a concert or a sporting event. <laughs> and so I feel like, to me, that's kind of what it is. You're going to where there's a bunch of people in a small space, and when you do that, bad things sometimes happen. And that's what gets reported. So to me, it's like, hey, you ever been to a concert? Well, you've been to Black Friday then. It's the same kind of thing. Yeah, my only gripe of Black Friday this year was how much of it started on Thanksgiving Day. I kind of have a... <clears throat> gripe with that, but you know. Yeah, a lot of people do. I, I had a thought about that too that I deleted. I was going to post on Facebook, but I didn't. And that thought was that I don't have a problem with it because America. It's freedom. <laughs> freedom. <laughs> freedom. <laughs> you do it on Thanksgiving? Let's do it. Um, and you know, you don't have to. No one has to do anything. And, yeah, no. You know, I and mean, then, my but, parents work thing. My brother and dad both work Thanksgiving. You know, they work in an industry where you don't take it off. So it's just, it's just the way it works sometimes. Yeah, and that's very true. And so it's not necessarily... We can't a, all be plagiarism consultants with an illustrious what? job. Oh, I'm well. Just well my thing is, <laughs> My thing is Christmas creep, though, you know? Christmas creep. Yeah, I get you. It's not so much the Thanksgiving itself or, oh, it's so horrible making people work on Thanksgiving. Right. But it's like, look, they put Christmas trees out before the Halloween stuff hits. Yeah. I mean, yeah. That's, there's, a, there's a point where Christmas is like half the freaking year. <laughs> we just... Yeah. And it seems like there was originally a line there. That was like the kickoff for the official Christmas season. And now we've kind of blurred that a little bit. So that's more my issue than you know people working yeah. on Thanksgiving. But, I mean, I don't know. At some point it's going to be June and we're putting Christmas stuff up. And I'm going to be like, oh, God. Follow the money. <clears throat> I, guess, I mean, that's the sad truth. You're right. <laughs> the sad truth is you're completely right. <laughs> you're completely right. But well, while you're on a roll of being right, you want to talk about some copyright news that we can be right about? Sure, let's try. Let's do our best to not mess this up too bad. Well, the big, <clears throat> the big story this week, Hotfile, the uh, famous cyber locker service, is already no more. 
Um, they reached a settlement with the MPA, the Motion Picture Association of America. They will pay $80 million in damages, and they had the option of staying open, apparently. This didn't actually close them, but the uh, judge ordered them that if they were going to stay open, they had to use digital fingerprinting technology to filter copyright infringing works, and Hot File right. apparently either unable or unwilling to comply. So, nah, it's okay. We'll just, uh, you know, kill it. And that's exactly what they did. So Hot File is already shut down. If you go to the hotfile.com domain, there's a um, fairly generic message. I'll just read it real fast. It says, as a result of a United States federal court having found hotfile.com to be in violation of copyright law, the site has been permanently shut down. If you are looking for your favorite movies or TV shows online, there are more ways than ever today to get high, to get high quality access to them on legal platforms. And so that's the end of Hot File, as it were. This also, by the way, it's worth noting, puts an end to Hot File's countersuit against Warner Brothers. Remember, they had that whole tiff where Warner Brothers allegedly ordered the takedown of some non-infringing files. Hot File was going back at them over that. That puts an end to that claim. Yeah. And, um, <clears throat> yeah, it, it basically brings an end to all of the Hot File-related action at once in Dot File itself. So did the hot file have a lot of money? Very good question. I do not know. I don't believe so, no. I believe this is yeah, one of those I mean, paper I, settlements. Yeah, yeah. you would have something on the record that, hey, you know, this is what we got. We settled for it, even though we, we might not never, ever see it. I was just curious because they do mention the idea that they're, um, in this article, that they were indistinguishable from uh, Mega Upload. And um, that was an argument that they made, the MPA. And... Make up, of course, the, the thing with them is people are suggesting they have a lot of money, you know, because they monetize some of the downloads and encourage people to upload things and be rewarded and so on and so forth. So I don't know and, if Hotfile had done Hot a similar File, thing and maybe and Hot, amassed a pile of money in the process. And, and Hotfile did do a lot of that, but Hotfile also was never as big as Mega Upload or anywhere near. Um, right. <clears throat> when they had the affiliate program, it was mentioned in the uh, initial ruling. Because remember, Hotfile was found to be infringing. They were found to be liable. The trial right. that was scheduled for Monday was solely on the issue of damages. Right. It was not actually going to be about Hot Files liability. That was already a, that that ship had sailed. Um, so that was one of the issues that was raised whenever they um, they talked about Hot Files liability. So that yeah. puts an end. So <clears throat> yeah, they did all that, but yeah, I mean, it's hard for me to believe. And maybe I'm wrong. Maybe this was a huge business and it had eighty million dollars in its back pocket or $80 million in assets, but maybe I'll be surprised, but I, I, I don't personally imagine Hot File having $80 million bucks just to turn a check over. Yeah. I mean, it seems like a lot. I mean, Meg, Chem.com and Mega Upload obviously did very, very well for themselves and had significant assets that were uh, able to be seized, mm -hmm. but yeah, I don't think that's as true for Hot File. Right. Um, so I guess, you know, We'll see. Maybe we'll hear something if they actually do uh, pay the settlement out. But yeah, it's, it 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 could be a deal where it's like you said they 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 settle for it. Though the MPA knows realistically they're never going to collect a good chunk of it. Right. It's not to say Hotfile doesn't have some assets that might be valuable and some money. Just I don't know if it's eighty million dollars. But yeah, I mean this is probably I think this is the biggest cyber locker closure like this since Mega Upload. So this is a pretty huge deal, um, but it's also worth noting that you know, cyber lockers have kind of been on the wane since Mega Uploads closure. They haven't been really as strong as an industry. Imagine that, you know, the number one, uh, number one company in the field gets shuttered suddenly and police and raided and seized, and the industry's not doing so good, you know. Right. Imagine that. But yeah, so this is a pretty big deal, but and a big win for the MPAA, and it, it heads off a potentially very interesting trial because the trial, the uh, MPA is going to be barred from using terms like piracy or theft or steal to describe uh, Hot Files' actions, hmm. which that was going to become a drinking game of its own. Every time, right. every time the lawyer of the MPAA has to artfully dodge saying piracy or theft, take a shot. You will not survive the trial. Um, yeah. So, yeah. <coughs> Long story short, it, this one seems to be dead and one and done now. I don't, I mean, it, it's a big case, it's a big story, but I really don't know what else to say about it. Right. 
Yeah. So, uh, moving on to a French court. A uh, French court has ordered, an, a Paris High Court, rather, I should say, has ordered Microsoft, Yahoo, and Google. Interestingly, Google, not shown in the image associated with the uh, site, um, but has ordered the three companies to remove a series of 16 streaming sites from its search results to completely nuke these domains. Um, this is the first time, and this court was initially asked to rule on whether or not ISPs in the country should be ordered to block these sites, which uh, has been ha happening pretty regularly in France, but the court went a step beyond and ordered the search engines to also remove them so they can't be found via search engines. It's unclear if it's only going to be search results in France that are missing these sites or internationally, but yeah, sort of a, a, a new step in this process. Yeah, yeah, and the, one article mentioned here specifically um, is well. One thing mentioned also is a different case in Ireland where they're going after gas torrents. I think we might have talked about that. Yeah, um, it sounds familiar because that's actually a site that I actually am familiar with. <laughs> Don't say actually twice. That's a lot of actually's yeah. there, but uh, <laughs> it's a site I'm familiar with because I I come across it. I think in in getting keyword searches for my book, and yeah, so I think it's interesting the balance between the search engines and kind of freedom of information, you know, it's not really true freedom because they're private companies that can control their indexes and it certainly has um, exhibited, uh, you know, or, you know, put control in place over their own indexes when it suits them or when there's a reason to do it. It's kind of the conversation we had with Ben Scheffner a little bit because, uh, you know, talking about how Google's role in that and how much they should do versus not do and where's the balance in keeping the Google search index um, not in anyone's pocket, I guess. Not <laughs> specifically in anyone's pocket. So this is tough. I, Google obviously can have a big impact by blocking uh, pirated websites that are known to be pirates. I don't know. I, I think it's interesting when we see these sorts of rulings. It's it's interesting how they're they seem to be more accepted outside of the U.S. Yeah. Like overall, in general. Yeah. I don't know about the U.K. specifically. I don't know how this has come out about over there, but in uh, in many other large countries that are not the U.S., it seems like these are rulings or these ideas, a suggestion of blocking um, search yeah. uh, sites from being searched or specific websites legally doing it, not just relying on the company to do it, uh, seems to be more accepted in other countries. And I don't know if that has more to do with, uh, you know, sort of the, the, the strong founding principles, you know, in America of our Constitution, of freedom of speech, and how people hold on to those and how they view uh, government interaction. But it's interesting to see. Well, I mean, and it's one of the things. America has that image of being a copyright maximalist, of being the one strong-arming all the other countries into, you know, taking these radical steps to enforce copyright, when in reality, you know, there's a lot of things that go on in other countries in the name of enforcing copyright that don't happen in the U.S. Right. And there's, I mean, I'm sh maybe U.S. companies played a role in lobbying for those, but it doesn't seem to be the U.S. government doing a lot of the work. So, you know, take it for what you will. I mean, Sopa and Pippa famously got shot down here in the United States, but yet Sopa and Pippa-like activities are taking place in other countries every day. If we yeah. reported every time a site blocked a, a, a country blo ordered its ISPs to block a site, we'd be here all week on the podcast just on those stories. So, yeah. and long story short, is it, it's... It's it's a situation where I think America's image is different from the reality in a lot of ways. You don't say. I don't. I know radical, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. hey, I'm curious about market share in France. I'm actually pulling up the Stat Counter global stats for surges in market share in France. Here in the U.S., Google has, um, you know, extremely <laughs> dominant uh, share of the market. I'm curious what the status is in in uh, France. It shouldn't be taking this long. Come on, Google. I mean, come on, uh, Stat Counter Global. There we go. All right, yeah, Google has a similar domination over there. According to the stack counter, and this is the aggregate numbers from every site that serves the stack counter, web counter code, which is pretty popular. I use it on my sites. It's a pretty popular server, so it's good, good general trending. Google is 92.93% in November mm -hmm. uh, of the market over there. Meanwhile, Bing comes in second, 2.89, followed by Yahoo at 2.29. Now, let me compare that to the U.S. I wonder if Google is uh, even more powerful over there, 92.93% in France and in the United States. We'll see in a moment. It's waiting for it to load. 
in the United States of America, Google is 90, oh, 79.63. So, you know, that's less than I thought it would be. And so France, actually, Google is more dominant. They'll have more impact over in France. Over here, Bing has 10%, 10.61. Yahoo has 7.19%. Really? Bing so, has 10%? That's kind of yeah. surprising. Yeah, Bing has 10% of the market. That's actually down a little bit in the last few months. Worldwide, Google's at 87.95, though. So worldwide, the U.S. is below the average. Um, I don't know. Maybe that's just because of Microsoft's efforts to market itself in the U.S. more than maybe in other countries. I, I don't know. Yeah. I'm not sure. I would still like to see a really competitive, you know, service to, to sort of go toe to toe with Google. Bing and Yahoo obviously haven't been able to really do it. Yeah. So I would like to see a truly competitive alternative search engine. Yeah, Baidu, who we're going to talk about a little later, they have 1.01% of the uh, of the global market, and uh, they're, chi yeah. they're they're a China-based uh, uh, search engine, right? Yeah, they're they're based in China. Yeah. I mean, I'm just curious how dominant they are in their own country, and then we can move on. <laughs> yeah, I thought last I'd heard they were pretty dominant. Yeah, I think they are. It's just China doesn't generate a lot of internet searches yet. Right. We'll probably change though. <laughs> Numbers alone indicate that if that's not the case, it will be the case soon. Yeah. Um. And and let me see. There's a note here. Huh. Yeah, China. Plus, there's the whole Great Firewall thing mm -hmm. and, and, how, and how it's controlled a little differently over there. But from what Stack Counter can measure, Baidu has 53.3 over there, and, and there's a site called 360 Search, which uh, is, I guess used to be, it includes the so, SO.com domain name, and they have 33.04. Google's in at 7.44%. Yeah, Google actually, I know, mostly retreated out of China. Yeah, and they've been on, a, it looks like, a steady decline. Early this year, in November, of, a year ago, they were at 17.26. Now they're at 7, so they've lost 10% year over year. Yeah, they last I'd heard, they actually pulled out of China and removed their offices and were backing out of the country. So yeah, so it's kind of a surprised. different, it's a different ball game to measure China. <laughs> yeah, it is. Predictably enough. Yeah. Well, Amy Mann, the musician Amy Mann, um... We talked previously that she filed a lawsuit against MediaNet. A mm -hmm. MediaNet is kind of one of those bizarre companies no one's ever heard of, but they handle music licensing and sort of the behind-the-scenes stuff for a lot of other companies, and those companies include like Yahoo Music, Playlist.com, and some other pretty big uh, music sites you might know and love. Well, according to, according to Amy, man, uh, MediaNet was licensing her songs without a proper license. <clears throat> and she sued them over that, and she dropped sort of you know a hint that she was not the only artist in this boat. Well, we don't know about other artists, but the judge has come back in this case and is allowing the lawsuit to move forward. In fact, seems to have given some indication that she, he strongly agrees with the arguments man is presenting. Um, the issue specifically is whether or not the contract man signed automatically renewed. Now, she felt it did not uh, for various reasons. MediaNet obviously th felt it did, but it seems like the judge is siding with her saying that MediaNet didn't even make any attempt to notify her that the contract was automatically renewed. There's no notice, no nothing. Right. Sort of, here we go, it's, it's continuing, and that was going to be the end of it. And she felt that was unfair and that violated the law, and the judge seems to so far have agreed that that's a very reasonable interpretation. So now this case can move forward, and if Mann does secure a victory here, there's no telling how many other artists might be in the exact same boat, because if this is the issue, the issue is sort of core to how MediaNet handles its contracts and licensing, it could be in trouble. Yeah, and I think it kind of underscores the problem with having agreements with individuals. Yeah. Versus, you know, imagine if you're a service like MediaNet that is licensing music and a lot of songs. And, you know, I don't necessarily think, regardless of how this case goes, that they're operating some sort of weird business where they're, you know, <laughs> letting contracts lapse and sticking it in the database. No, um, I, think they made a, I think they made a blunder here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think, but, and, and you're talking about Amy Mann, which I, is an artist that has fans. Like, I don't want to downplay her success or popularity. Certainly she has fans and people who listen to her music, and certainly it's valuable enough for MediaNet to license it. So you got to keep it in that perspective. But um, you can say she's not the most high-profile account that they have, and that doesn't mean that it's okay to just take her work and use it. It uh, certainly doesn't. But, again, going back to the whole idea, if they had to manage these relationships with every artist in the world, you know, that's unwieldy. 
um, and just doomed to fail. I mean, of course, you could have you could probably you can have a computer analyze those things, say, okay, X Y Z, it's time for this person to renew. Automatic email goes out. Click a link to renew. <laughs> link not to renew. You know, whatever. You can also you can probably automate the process, but it's easy to see how in all the artists one might slip through. Um, if they did the wrong thing, certainly they should pay something for that. MediaNet, uh, like you said, powers a lot of different services. I have heard of them before. We talked about this when this story first broke. Uh, we talked about it on the show previously. Mm-hmm. They were one of the reasons that a service like Turntable FM could get started. And interestingly enough, That's Turntable right. FM just got shut down. Just shut shut down, not because of legal issues, but because they're pivoting the company and they didn't, you know, I guess the business didn't work out. So uh, after two years of being a service, Turntable FM shut down just the other day, a couple days ago, and. Um, but, you know, I think services like MediaNet hopefully allow startups to experiment with the music industry um, and lead to new dre- revenue generation, new streams of revenue, I should say. A service like Turntable was interesting, was experimental, was different. Um, I think maybe you'll see other services pop up, but it made the music industry some money because licensing. I know I discovered songs on it that I went on to buy. And so uh, I think that's good with media- services like MediaNet and similar companies. Uh, yeah offer that opportunity. I think you look at this sort of situation and it becomes uh, tougher for a, a company like MediaNet to say, okay, we're going to license individuals. I think um, you know, you look at that situation because you always want someone else to be dealing with that. You want one of the big four. You want the big independent one. I forgot their name. Merlin, is it? Yeah. Is it Merlin? Merlin, Merlin deals with a lot of the independent labels, independent music companies. I mean, that's good. They can kind of get all those things in line and update it themselves. I think that's really what maybe this underscores in some ways. And again, if they did the wrong thing, they should pay, and I'm sure they will. Yeah, and one thing that's interesting is this does underscore sometimes the importance of middlemen in this industry. Right. I know we, we the middlemen get a lot of flack. They get a lot of flack in every industry, but doubly so in music. You know, oh, yeah. they don't make the music, they don't distribute it, they just take a cut of the profit. No, but they do organize and compile the licenses and stay on top of this stuff so that people who um, make the music and the people who distribute the music can work together without panic ensuing and chaos, yeah. you know? Yeah, I mean, no men are always vulnerable, but they're vulnerable if someone else can do the work they do. So yeah. I think that's the tricky thing here. MediaNet doesn't necessarily want to manage all those relationships, and kind of the way it's set up already kind of works against that. People don't sign, uh, you know, publishing contracts and, you know, performing contracts or whatever. They don't sign over their rights to... Uh, licensing companies, generally like MediaNet, they sign them over to the mm-hmm. intermediary, the publishing company, the label, who then uh, licenses exactly. the works to that company, who then <laughs> do it to someone else. <coughs> so there's a few middlemen in there, really, but uh, as long as you're indispensable or you've set up the industry to work in your favor, where it's hard to exist without working with you, then uh, you might be all right. Yeah, and that's just it. it, it it's not a matter of are you or are you not a middleman, it's what do you do to earn your, what work are you doing to improve the marketplace? And plenty of, there are plenty of middlemen, I think, out there that don't do enough or don't do anything to improve the marketplace or to help the transactions, and there are many who do. Yeah. And obviously, these licensing firms are companies that do help, and we're seeing that again and again and again in these types of situations where things like this get possibly messed up and big damages are possibly going to be awarded. So yeah. yeah, hopefully I'm I'm hoping this is not a systemic problem for MediaNet, and that there this is a problem that was just a one-off issue, and that they're going to address it and move forward. I'm hoping that's what it is, but I'm worried that this could be a more serious issue for them, and a more broad one. So I guess we'll find out. Well, Tom, moving forward to our Baidu story, uh, Yoku Tudo Tudo. Tudo? Yoko Tudo, I'm calling it that. There we go, that works. Is a, uh, it's described here as a Chinese online video site, and they recently won a copyright infringement case against the search engine Baidu, which, as you just pointed out, has a majority market share of the yep. search market in China. Um, Baidu has been ordered to pay 491,000 won, or uh, 101,000 US dollars, for illegally hosting 18 Chinese television shows that uh, Yoku Tudao um, had obtained licenses for, or according to this, exclusive rights to. So long story short, uh, Baidu's uh, file uh, video hosting service got dinged. At least, I don't know how major of a hit this is for them. They seem like a pretty large company that won't be too bothered by $100,000, but still, 
a pretty important victory in a country that has a reputation for letting these types of things slide. Yeah, and has it ever mattered as far as whether or not the work was Chinese or not? In fact, as far as like uh, how it's been enforced over the years, I, I, I do know. think I do think it's been easier for Chinese artists and Chinese companies to enforce their rights than for outsiders. I do right. think there has been an element of that, but I think a lot of that is because working within the Chinese legal system is very difficult in many ways. So it may it may be one of the issues in it, but yeah, d definitely. There's every case I've heard of Baidu being dinged for something like this. It's been Chinese authors or Chinese um, television shows, etc. Yeah. So, I think, but yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's interesting to see it happen. Um, and I guess we'll see if it becomes something where they also do this more with international companies. And Baidu, of course, is under intense pressure from international bodies right now. We talked about it, I think it was last week. Um, a massive lawsuit against them from various international forces. So I guess we'll see what happens. Yeah. Maybe uh, the image will change. Well, this next article on Torrent Freak, we talk about something of a milestone for the uh, site Files Tube. They have hit, as of this week, their 10 millionth DMCA takedown notice with Google. 10 million DMCA takedown notices. With Google, that puts them in uh, nearly, very nearly double the nearest competitor, and a runaway site, every regard. And this uh, pr transparency report makes it pretty obvious who's being targeted by both. The uh, BPI is the number one filer with them. That's the British recorded music. That's the British music industry, and the uh, U.S. counterpart, the RAAA, is next. Between those two, you have about uh, six million of the ten million notices filed. So, there you go. But yeah, pretty, um, pretty. Uh, what would you say here? Um, pretty much an, a, a deeply unwanted superlative, perhaps. Yeah, I mean, it depends. Uh, you know, I think some people might wear this as a badge of honor, and I suspect they will. Such as when I ban people, it's a badge of honor for them. <laughs> for some of them, uh, you know, some people might use it as, uh, I, you know, people spin it how they want to spin it. I've had you know plenty of users over the years do that exact thing and say, oh, I was banned just like XYZ. All the good people get banned. <laughs> yeah, they sure do. And so, uh, you know, files too, files too, from what this article says, a torrent freak seems pretty, um, pretty much like they don't care. Pretty much like they, they, would, they would be the type that would say, oh, look at that, look at us. We got 10 million now. Just in how they appear to be going about their strategy, torrent freaks points to the fact that they have... Uh, you know, a survey on their website asking people if, uh, imagine as you're searching for your favorite TV series on file two, will the detailed search results be useful to you? And uh, you can see the links are full of pirated content and things. So uh, uh, it's pretty clear that they have an idea what's going on here and that they don't care. And and so, you know, I don't know how to look at this. But it is a weird thing, 10 million, that's a lot, obviously, of DMC notices. It's, you know, you filed around 11 million yourself, right? <laughs> yeah, with that files tube alone. Yeah, yeah no. No, it, it's definitely a lot of notices. And what's interesting about it to me is all this talk about Google take factoring in DMC notices in the ranking and it's starting to delist or at least de emphasize some of these sites. Files tube consistently remains near the top of a lot of search queries, even for very, you know, unspecified things. You know, if you're looking for just generic you know, generic uh, keywords it oftentimes ranks at or near the top. And this one is the runaway leader in DMCA notices. And I think that shows that Google's efforts to de-emphasize these sites has been pretty ineffective if FilesTube is still showing up so highly. Yeah. So, I don't know. It's, it's, it, it's frustrating that a site can draw... Um, it, it can draw so many... Um, DMC notices and not see any real repercussions. And I, I have a feeling that maybe something will happen to files to eventually. Yeah, well, this puts them on the radar at least. They're definitely, they are definitely on the radar. There is no <laughs> they, one. They're a blip, <laughs> even like old <laughs> sonars. <laughs> yeah, they're on the radar. There's no way they're not. I mean, when you've got 4.7 million notices from BPI alone. You're on the radar, but yeah, it'll be interesting to see if they actually take any action against the site and the people who operate it, because that hasn't happened yet. I mean, other major sites that have gotten 
this level, this caliber, like even like the Pirate Bay, yes, the Pirate Bay is still up, but the four founders of it have, were arrested and convicted. Mega Upload was shut down, you know, and so you you typically expect sites that get this far above the radar to have something happen to them. I'm not saying it will. I'm not saying it won. I'm just saying it's typically what's historically happened. Yeah. Well. Well, here's a story. Um, I know we both are at least wanting to talk about a little bit, which is Spotify. Now, Spotify has been the subject of a lot of controversy among musicians lately. Musicians feel that Spotify is not paying an adequate amount of royalties. That a song can get streamed lots and lots of times in Spotify, and they get mere pennies or dollars for it and barely see anything for their efforts. Well, Spotify has launched a new site called Spotify for Artists. It's a uh, blog slash, you know, information slash analytics site that talks to artists about how the royalties are calculated, explains what's going on behind the scenes, and also offers some free analytics to see how much their tracks are being performed on the site. Mm -hmm. And the idea is kind of extend an olive branch to artists, and it also shows these kind of weird and a very hypothetical graphs about this is how much you guys can be making if we get this many subscribers, yeah, and so forth. That I think is kind of guessworky, but you know, long story short, it's a very interesting. Um, it's a it's a very interesting site, a very interesting attempt to extend an olive branch to artists who, like I said, have been very critical of Spotify in recent months. Yeah, and as a point of disclosure, um, you know, the Spotify artists team, uh, if you look at the blog post where they announced this, there's eight people mentioned. Um, one of them, D.A. Wallach, is an artist in residence at Spotify, and he's actually an acquaintance of mine. I was just talking to him the other day on Facebook. And um, Mark Williamson I've talked to before as well. I think he kind of leads the team, so, you know, whatever you want to take from that advice was. Yeah. But uh, I don't – see, I, this is interesting to me. I really like this website. I like the Spotify artists website. I like that they are – uh, I just like how they explain the data, how they explain the benefit of Spotify, share some best practices which are going to be added to, have some of these this documentation, the charts are interesting about the songs and things. Um, I, I think this is something that YouTube tried to do with YouTube creators but didn't do as well. And I think I would like to see YouTube kind of take it a little farther, like Spotify is done here with artist services. You know, when you talk about artists being critical of Spotify, yes, some high-profile artists have been critical, but I really believe that the overwhelming majority of artists who use Spotify are, are not in that camp. You know, they're just quietly either liking the service or seeing how it grows. Um, and because right. you know, there's a lot of music on Spotify. There's a lot of artists on Spotify, and we get, you know, obviously that when a big artist, when somebody, uh, gosh, uh, who in this article it's mentioned, when... Um, Gosh, who's one of the artists here? Tom York says something. Of course, people are going to report that and pay attention to it. But overwhelmingly, artists are either pleased or ambivalent to Spotify right now. I think most artists that I've spoken to are in kind of a wait-and-see approach. Right. They really don't know where this is going. Um, there is a growing sense of impatience and a growing sense of, okay, how long is it really going to take? But um, right. most artists I talk to and I've, I've spoken to, not you know, that have not been obviously and very publicly critical, have kind of said, you know, we're just kind of waiting and seeing right now. We're not really. There's no opinion. Yeah. Don't really think it's good. Don't think it's bad. It's just it. It is what it is. You know. Yeah, and something that DA's said a lot, and something that I agree with is, you know, you can be critical of Spotify, but. He says what kind of their what their mission is in a way is to get people used to the idea of paying for music again, because you know, the the person who buys CDs like me <laughs> is, isn't isn't so much your issue these days when it comes to monetizing your music. It's the person who wants the music now online, uh, streaming and quickly and honestly somewhat cheaply. Let's say, um, and they'll pirate your music. But the idea here is trying to convert some of those pirates into paying customers. And so it's a revenue stream that you wouldn't otherwise have in many cases. So I, I think that's an interesting way to look at it. And when they show numbers like, like you said, guesswork, which it's guesswork. But Ooh. I think what, what, they're, what they're trying to illustrate here is a reason to drive people to Spotify, right? If Spotify only has uh, 6 million or 10 million uh, paying, is it paying, yeah, paying subscribers now, 
according to industry sources, according to this article at The Guardian. 10 million users now. I mean, you have to consider the enormity of the a world of the civilization of people who consume music online, and then you understand that there's a lot of ways this can grow if people support it. And part of the and one of the groups that has to support it is artists. And so you have to understand that if you only have 10 million people on this service paying $10 a month, you aren't going to make 10 million from an album on Spotify. The money isn't there. But if you get 40 million people on Spotify paying, then it becomes more feasible to, from their example, pay for a hit album, the number of streams going to $2.1 million. Over a year, that could be a $10 million album just off Spotify revenue. But you have to get that adoption. So I think that's one of the things they're trying to illustrate here is, yes, for some, these royalties may seem small now, or for many, they may seem small. But remember, we have 10 million paying customers right now. Help us get to 40 million, and those amounts, and it won't be any guesswork. They might not go up this much, but they will go up. So I think it's it's an interesting thing. It's an interesting uh, number to put out there to share some of these numbers. They said, for example, a global hit album, January 2013, actual monthly royalties right now, or, or there, a global hit album, meaning a top album, number one album, $425,000 in a month from streaming on Spotify. I'm surprised it's that high. Like myself, that's that's a lot of money. Um, yeah. Miley Cyrus is doing very well. <laughs> yeah, I mean she is. She is. Hey, and but but if they get to forty million, that's two point one million dollars. But for a niche indie album, you know that's popular in its niche. They put three thousand three hundred out there as an actual monthly royalty fee they paid for that type of album. And if you get to forty million, that becomes seventeen thousand. So I think uh, seventeen thousand a month is not making anyone rich, but it will be for an indie artist. Supporting a lifestyle, at least, when you add it into other revenue streams and they do other things. Yeah, and bearing in mind, of course, for an indie band, it likely is going to be divided up amongst multiple members. Right, right. Or indie, there's indie solo artists, which won't have to do that. So <laughs> that's a problem with every band. <laughs> you know, when you add more people, you split the cake. But yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting to see these numbers. And they shared some other numbers that I thought were, were interesting as well. Let me, let me run through this real quick. Um, they cited a study by NPD Group that said that the average U.S. paying listener uh, of music a year um, pays $55 a year for music. The average annual spend of that minority of people who buy music of any form, so they found 45% of people buy music of any form, period, of the U.S. internet population of 190 million. And, uh, and that minority of 45% spends an average of $55.45 a year. I spend more than that. <laughs> yeah, but, well, obviously. But I, I'm not the average. So Spotify... Patrick. No one has ever called you average. Yeah, and, and, and but but by its very nature, a Spotify premium subscriber in the U.S. will pay $120 a year, just yeah. on the subscription fee. Not well, any that other is if they have the uh, if they have the, the highest end account. That's yeah. premium, yeah, uh, the premium, premium. level oh. subscriber will pay $120 a year. Yeah, that's true. So of course, the mobile subscriber will pay $5 a month, which is $60 a year, which is still more than $55 a yeah. year. <laughs> either way, so. I think that's an interesting way to look at it, and that kind of pushes artists. I'm not saying artists are being greedy. I'm not saying that. But I'm just saying, look at how little people spend on music. You know? And it's sad. You know? Don't get me wrong. From the mid-'90s especially, the boom era of music sales. But what are you going to do about it? And I think Spotify is more of the solution than the problem. Well, the only issue I think a lot of artists have with Spotify is how little they make off the free streaming, too, is another problem. Right. And that is that. That's one of the areas where there's the the, the the tug and the push at the same time. While Spotify is probably right that offering the free streaming is good for its business, and to have that there as an alternative is good. It also doesn't produce a lot of revenue, and royalties are as this site shows are calculated on revenue. They pay seventy percent of their revenue out as royalties. So if they don't get revenue, they don't pay royalties. Long and right. short of it, um, but the free model does factor into those that revenue and the yeah. royalties. If the free model wasn't there, these royalty numbers would all be smaller. Yeah, but the problem is it also really jacks up the listener numbers and makes it look like they get pennies per stream or absolutely abysmal amounts per stream. Right. So that's it. It that's what jacks up those stream count numbers and keeps the um. The, uh, the, the the amount paid per stream, in many cases, abysmally low. 
and I can understand the frustration. There is a lot of frustration among artists, and I think a lot of it is l understandable and legitimate. But I also think that you know Spotify, as a business, is trying to a do things legitimately, and that's always good. <laughs> Right. Not some pirate streaming site or whatever. And the other thing is they are trying to do something to get people to spend more money on music. And I think in the long run that has a lot of potential. It's just a matter of it, how do we get there. And right. getting from A to B could be very time-consuming, could be very difficult. But if we do get there, it could be a very good thing. I mean, I personally am a huge fan of Spotify. I love listening to it. I love using it. I mean, the power of Spotify is I have a friend of mine who's a guitarist, and I was at a, a show. He was an open mic event he was hosting, and he talked about he's doing a, a Christmas comedy thing coming up mm -hmm. uh, on the 14th. And I'm like, oh, I have an anti-Christmas list full of Christmas parodies and stuff in Spotify. And so I pull out my phone, and I share him that list from my phone right there in the bar, and he's going to go home, and he's going to listen to it, and he may – even do covers of one or two of those songs, which will in turn generate a uh, ASCAP or BMI, depending upon you know who's right. licensing. They may generate other licenses and royalties, and so it could help further down the road that way. Yeah, uh, and I think when you talk about getting there, I think that's part of what they're trying to establish here is they need help getting there. Right? Ten, obviously, ten million paying subscribers isn't going to get there. No. So they need, and I, I mean, and I, I don't know that I expect that to be there anyway, no matter how you split the money up. But they need more people to get there. And just let's see a couple more numbers here that were interesting. Um, they have, uh, what is this, research that, I guess from the same NPD group research, but the average value of the U.S. music listener per year is $25. The average listener of Spotify customer per year, free and premium. So what the free makes on ads, what premium pays, is $41. So the average Spotify user is worth more to the music industry, is paying more money, than the average non or the average consumer in general, um, and they pay seventy percent to rights holders. Anyone who might not know that, I, did, I didn't know the specific split, but seventy percent to rights holders, thirty percent to Spotify. And what else do we have here? What else was interesting? And also, they make oh, well, they do mention they pay about six to eight thousand dollars in royalties, eight thousand four hundred per one million listens. Um, they have some kind of anonymous figures here, or. Yeah, they don't really cite the figure specifically, but they say they like an example video streaming service pays three thousand per one million listens. Probably saying YouTube, for example, which um, I could buy. I don't know. It depends on the CPM of the ads I've seen. Radio streaming service pays about thirteen hundred to fifteen hundred per one million listens. So if you believe those numbers, if they're anywhere in their ballpark, then Spotify is obviously paying um, a lot more. And one other point they make that you know we talk about a lot is that having the free tier having a free legal way to listen to music has an impact on piracy. Now, as an artist, you don't have to put your music on Spotify, right? You don't have to. No one forces you to, right? You're not, no one has your gunpoint. But having your music on Spotify in the free tier means people pirate it less. It's, can't, you can't deny that, right? Hopefully. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean it's just you can't deny it. There's at least one person out there who's listening to Spotify instead of pirating. At least one. We can safely say that, can't we? <laughs> yeah, and that's probably a very safe bet. Yeah, so, yeah. and I, I mean I, they cite I, some numbers here. I don't know how much I would. I mean it's just generic numbers. It's not Spotify tied, but they're numbers that make sense. Numbers from Columbia University, um, which basically says that uh, when there is a free legal alternative, then you, people are less to pirate music. Fifty-five percent of eighteen to twenty-nine year olds are less to pirate. Forty percent of thirty to forty-nine percent of forty to thirty to forty-nine year olds are less to pirate. You know, there's always a, there's a portion of every demographic that's less to pirate if you have a free legal alternative. Yeah. Well, one of course, thing some I... artists might say, "I don't want my music to be free," in which case they don't have to put it on there, right? Yeah, but that's your risk. You do incur the risk of being pirated more. Yeah. So. Now, one thing I did find interesting is they talked about how they are building up their uh, Spotify artist profiles mm -hmm. to hopefully include ways to sell merchandise directly through it and also yeah. to help further promote social media and other avenues of connecting with artists. I thought that was pretty interesting. Yeah, not, yeah, not to miss the forest for the trees here with our, you know, with our royalty and copyright talk. This is this this website and their stuff is about more than you know, more than just just that. They did a launch as analytics platform and yeah, that's all pretty interesting. Yeah, I mean, they did a lot of stuff. The analytics platform, you can I, you have to verify yourself through some process, but then yeah. you get access to free statistics to see how you're how often you're being streamed and what you can do to improve that. 
Yeah. And so, yeah, there, there's some pretty cool stuff in there. I mean, this is some good artist outreach. You yeah. know, and even the artists that are skeptical of Spotify, I think, should at least listen, you know? Yeah, and it's interesting to see how they're, you know, and it's easy to see how they will and have already in some ways kind of make it more um, feasible to connect with fans on Spotify to tie in, you know, when I'm going on tour with who is listening to my songs. You know, and you can see that they're kind of heading in that direction if they're not part of the way they're already with their new profiles where you can list where people are touring. It's not hard to see, again, if they haven't already because I'm not, I'm a Spotify free user myself. Um, if I'm not on it all the time, you know, it, it's easy to see where they might say, okay, well, we can tell that these people are listening in North Carolina. Well, this band's going to be in Charlotte. Okay, so then we can serve a little message to all those people who are listening in North Carolina and say they're going to be in Charlotte on this date. And so, you know, that's kind of an interesting, kind of a different, exciting thing, too, to be able to match the, the, the opportunities that people have to give you money with the people who are actually in a position to do it, who are actually in that area, who are actually local, and who are consuming your music. Um, that, you know, there's opportunity there as well. Yeah, I agree. So, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm definitely excited about this because this is the kind of dialogue we need. It's right. conversation, you know. That's what I like most is real conversation, you know. And hopefully, because artists kind of said, hey, we feel this. And Spotify said, okay, but what about this? Now we can have a dialogue, you know. Yeah. That's conversation happening. That's good. I mean, that's the best part about it to me is... Now the sides are talking, and maybe now we can get somewhere. Yeah, that's what it's not just you know two people shouting past each other. That's yeah. what I like. So I'm glad about that, and I'm I'm hoping that trend more than anything else continues. Well, our final story involves an embarrassment. Yeah, I'm interested to hear what you think of this story. I. Okay. That's my thoughts on the show. Good night, everybody. No, um, okay, long story short here, Patrick, you probably have encountered these at least somewhere. In 2011, the United States issued what are known as these forever stamps. These are stamps uh -huh. that you can use forever and never and never because you know, no matter how much postage goes up, they will always remain useful. So you buy them now, and if postage goes up to uh, $3 a stamp, you can still use them. It's fine. Um, send a first-class letter with them. Your only bet is if whether or not the Postal Service is here in, you know, 10 years. Um, but long and short of it, one of the stamps featured the Statue of Liberty. I mean, why wouldn't you feature the Statue of Liberty? It's an American icon. Of course you would. It makes perfect sense to feature the Statue of Liberty on one. Unfortunately, it doesn't actually feature the Statue of Liberty. You know, rather than going and taking a photo of the real Statue of Liberty in New York Harbor... Um, they apparently obtained a photo through a photo service of a, a, a fake Statue of Liberty in front of a hotel in Vegas and used that on the stamps. And now the, uh, the artist behind that statue is suing the U.S. Postal Service for copyright infringement. Uh, Robert Davidson is the sculptor's name. And, yeah, that's pretty bad. And looking at it, I mean, I've never really looked at the stamp. I just kind of have that. Because at a glance, it's, yep, that's the Statue of Liberty. But yeah. if you actually look at it, especially if you look at a photo of the real Statue of Liberty side by side, it's pretty obviously not the Statue of Liberty. The facial features are very different between the two. Yeah, I've never looked at it before myself. Here, let me pull yeah. up a couple of photos. Yeah, it, I mean, if you take a moment to look at the actual a photo of the actual Statue of Liberty, you see pretty quickly that the two are not alike. And, and in fact, if you open up in the link I sent you, yeah. if you click the actual image, it opens up a gallery where you can see some side-by-sides and so forth. Okay. Actually, okay, yeah. actually they, they don't show a side-by-side, -side, but they do show the um, more shots of the uh, statue involved. And it's just... Yeah, there is a side-by-side, -side, you're right. Yeah, there is one, but not of the face, which is... Yeah, not, clo not close enough name. to be worth a damn. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, they obviously are similar. And of course, the Statue of Liberty is in the public domain. You can do this. Right. This is fine. But that's not a, that, that in and of itself is not a copyright issue. But they made several major changes to the way the face looked, to the way the robe fits, and the various parts of the statue to make it more, as this article said, sultry, which is <laughs> not a word I want associated with the Statue of Liberty, guys. 
sultry and appealing because I want my Statue of Liberty to be the sultry kind. Yeah, I mean, there. Yeah, you're right. It's different, but I, I, I don't know. I, I, maybe I need a different picture of the friggin' thing. But yeah, it is different. Well, it I mean, what do you? <sighs> yeah. So, so it sounds like your perspective is the USPS made a, or whoever decided to make this a stamp made a silly mistake. They made a pretty bad goof because yeah. this guy does have copyright and whatever is new in his work, and there are elements of it, the eyes and the nose and so forth, that are new, and um. Long and short of it is, it's a pretty significant goof, and they've already lost one case like this dealing with the Korea, Korean War Memorial. They already lost that one, and it looks like they're on track to lose this one now for the same reasons. It's just, the issue is simple. It's, it's someone else's statue. Yes, it's based on the Statue of Liberty, but there are still parts of it that are new, parts of it that qualify for protection, and part, some of those parts are on your stamp. I mean, it may seem silly, and in many ways it is. It was a silly statue to begin with, but um, yeah, this is a, one of those avoidable mistakes. Yeah. Just, oh, this is a rookie error. <laughs> yeah, I, I was uh, I was expecting to see in the comments of stories like, um, "You can't own the Statue of Liberty." Yeah, and <laughs> the comments are guys, quite yeah. different, if I remember correctly. Uh, other stories I've not. That's right. This one doesn't have comment. There no, it does. It does. It's kind of hidden. That's all. Which is probably for the best. <laughs> yeah. Which on Yahoo. This is, we're linking to the AP's coverage on Yahoo News. So yeah, it's for the best. But, yeah. How um, was the sculptor not infringing when he copied the, the statue in the harbor? Good question, Vernon. And we just covered that. Which I mean, this, most people are might not be that aware that it's in the public domain. Yeah, the original Statue of Liberty is well into the public domain. Um, <laughs> somewhere there's a dusty piece of paper somewhere deep in France where the original copyright on the statue <laughs> but that is a very good question under copyright rules at the time the Statue of Liberty may never have been protected by copyright it depends because uh, I don't know what the copyright rules in France were and right. you pointed out that it was actually built it was designed and built in France as a gift to the US um, I'm unclear whether it ever had copyright protection, but if it ever did, that copyright protection long, long since lapsed. So, yeah, that's one. It's just, come on, guys. I mean, really, you could have just sent some guy with a camera to New York Harbor to take a few pictures of the Statue of Liberty and been done with it. Right. You give him a DSLR camera, give him an afternoon to go take photos of the Statue of Liberty. There is, you know, it is it is a national park. You know, there is a national park website. I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure it has some pictures that were taken yeah. by the national federal park. government. Yeah, in the public domain. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, I'm sure you could have found images of the real Statue of Liberty that would have worked. And the bad thing about it is, according to this article, uh, the U.S. Postal Service was unaware of the mistake until a stamp collecting magazine did an expose. How often do you hear the words? Expose and stamp collecting magazine <laughs> in the same sentence. Think about that. This is this is the biggest thing to hit stamp sense adhesive. We got a big scope here. <laughs> Jenkins, we're gonna we're gonna blow this one wide open. <laughs> it's not the real Statue of Liberty. <laughs> <laughs> Jenkins, stop the presses. We gotta we gotta run this one. <laughs> That's just oh my god. It's just, how do you mess it up that badly that a stamp magazine gets an expose? That's funny. <laughs> Man, but yeah, no, it's just, this is a pretty big blunder. I think I'm pretty sure that U.S. flag on there is not the real United States flag. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's an artist rendering. I only see seven stars. Really? You see seven of that? I see one, two, three, five, I see six. Oh, wait, there's a seventh up in the corner. Yeah, they count the little ones, like the ones that are just part, hanging over. Part, like, I see, like, the also, I don't think one. that's red. I think that's crimson. See, this isn't the real flag. <laughs> they, they, uh, they, this is, is a Thomas Kincaid. It has got the Albanian flag and shot it from a weird angle. That's all it is. Yeah. Oh, man. No, it's, it is it is similar to that, though, and it's just, uh, you know, the Postal Service, I'm trying to sympathize with you. You're going through some hard times, but this was just dumb. Yeah. This was a big blunder, and my, my hope is that this gets resolved quickly and doesn't become the thing to bankrupt the U.S. Postal Service, because I like my mail. I really do. Mm. 
Anyway, that's all I've got. Patrick, got any final thoughts on this or any other stories? No, that's it. Well, on that note, everyone, thank you very much for joining us. My name is Jonathan Bailey. I am from the website Plagiarism Today, which can be found at plagiarismtoday.com. You can find me at my copyright and plagiarism consulting firm at copybyte, C-O-P-Y-B-Y-T-E.com. Find me on Twitter, username Plagiarism Today, or send me a good old-fashioned email to jonathan at plagiarismtoday.com. And I'm Patrick O'Keefe at the Afrology Network. I blog at managingcommunities.com. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Google+. Plus. It's Patrick O'Keefe. Well, on that note, everyone, thank you very much for joining us, and we will see you guys next week.